Amen. Hey, as you're having a seat, give somebody a high five. Tell them you love them. Paula, high five from way over here. You're sitting by yourself. Okay, anybody else sitting by yourself, Dad, high five. Um, hey, before we get into the sermon, I do want to celebrate something with you guys. Last week, Easter was awesome. I hope you got to be part of one of our Easter services either here or in Madison. And, um, you know, one of the things that we mentioned is here in Huntsville, $5 is going to be donated on behalf of everybody who shows up to help end homelessness. And then in Madison, they did a $10 donation to help this school where that church meets in. And so just from Huntsville alone, uh, because of because we brought our friends with us last weekend, um, just from Huntsville alone, $3,750 will be donated to help um, to help those who are experiencing homelessness right here in Huntsville. If you happen to be here and you are experiencing homelessness, I just want you to know, like, man, we, we're a church for you. We want you... Um, we want you to come be part of this church with us. Like, let us do life with you. Do life with us. Um, uh, so anyways, that's something to celebrate. I love that. Um, if I've not had a chance to meet you yet, my name is Tim, Tim Milner. I'm one of the pastors here, and I am glad you have joined us today. Um, we started this church for anyone who feels like church isn't for them. So maybe you've never been to church. Maybe you've been hurt by a church. Maybe you just didn't know where to get started. Uh, there are probably way better churches out there, but I want you to know we are glad you are here with us today. We, we want this to be a safe place for you to explore who Christ is. Um, I, I know I, I have, and I'm sure others in this room have found love and joy and peace and an identity and purpose and meaning uh, through a relationship in Jesus Christ. And I, I'd love for you to be able to find that as well. All right, let's, uh, let's jump into our sermon. Uh, welcome, Madison. Welcome, Huntsville. Welcome to everybody who's watching online. I'm excited about what we're going to be talking about today. We are starting a, a new series from the book of Revelation. Specifically, we're going to look at the seven letters uh, to seven churches that we find in Revelation chapter 2 and Revelation chapter 3. And I, I, think, I think this is going to be a, a challenging series um, today, we're going to look at the first one. It's a letter to a church in Ephesus. And before we get in and we read the letter to Ephesus, I, I want you to be asking yourself, I want you to be thinking, have you ever been to a church that was really strict on rules, but, I mean, it just, there seemed like there was no love there? You're, you know, a few people in Huntsville, Madison, have you, have you ever been there? Um, I hope you're not thinking about this church or our church. We certainly haven't been perfect on this. Like, we got to get better at this. And because Jesus actually addresses this. Jesus addresses the kind of church that, man, they're, they're great. Like, I mean, like they're, man, they, they know their theology and they know their doctrines and, and they stand for the truth. But, 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 but churches that do that but don't have love, that's a big problem. All right? Now, as we get into reading this first text, um, uh, 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 we're going to be in Revelation chapter 2. Um, here's something you need to know. Uh, m most scholars agree that this letter to Ephesus and all seven of the letters we'll look at over the next six weeks, um, they should be understood in three ways. The first way that each of these letters needs to be understood is historical. All right, so we're about to read a letter to Ephesus. Like Ephesus was an actual church. Like this letter was an actual letter to an actual church, okay? So this, this letter should be understood from a historical standpoint. This letter could also be understood from like a prophecy standpoint. Uh, most scholars point to like there's a lot of clues in the text here that each one of these seven churches represent uh, one of the eras of the church, okay? So, so the era that we're going to be looking at today, um, if this is true, if this is prophetic, if this is an era of the church, is the apostolic age. This is from 33 AD, um, the day of Pentecost, when the church was officially started, all the way uh, to around 90, uh, 95, I'm sorry, 95 AD, when John the Apostle died, all right? John the Apostle was the last apostle to die, so, so this is from 33 to 90 AD. What we're about to read today was generally true for that whole season. So it was true for a local church, historically, it was true for a whole era of churches, and then third, it applies to us today. It applies for us today. So this should be personal. What we're reading today, we need to learn from that early church. We need to learn from that era of that church. And we need to figure out principles, things that Jesus loves. And today we're even going to look at something Jesus hates. And what it means for our church, what it means for essential today. What does it mean for you today? All right? So, so it's historical. It's prophetic. It should also be personal. So if no further ado, let's read the letter that Jesus wrote to the church in Ephesus Revelation chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. 
write this letter to the angel of the church in Ephesus. This is the message from the one who holds the seven stars in his right hand. Who are we talking about? Jesus. And the one, or the one, who walks among the seven gold lampstands. What are the seven gold lampstands? Does anybody know your book of Revelation? It's a church. It's a church. So this is it. Jesus is saying, hey, I'm writing this letter, and I'm the one who walks amongst the seven churches, all right? I'm the one who walks amongst your church. Here's what he says. If you have a red letter Bible, all these, all these words should be in red because this is, this is from the mouth of Jesus. Here's what he says. I know all the things you do. Anybody nervous about that? Okay. I have, but he actually means it in a good way right here. I know all the things you do. I have seen your hard work and your patient endurance. I know you do not tolerate evil people. You have examined the claims of those who say they are apostles but are not. You have discovered they are liars. You have patiently suffered for me without quitting. All right, let's kind of move into the second part of the letter here. Uh, but, um, all right, there, there are good butts in the Bible. There are bad butts in the Bible. This is one of the bad butts in the Bible, okay? But I have this complaint against you. You don't love me or each other as you did at first. Look how far you have fallen. Turn back to me. And do the works you did at first. If you don't repent, I will come and remove your lampstand from its place among the churches. All right, I love this. Jesus, if you want to know, anybody ever got constructive feedback at work? Do you like compliment sandwiches? Well, Jesus gives them, okay? Jesus started with a compliment. He said, but you got this wrong. He's going to close it with a compliment. Uh, but this is in your favor. You hate the evil deeds of the Nicolaitans just as I do. Anyone with ears to hear must listen to the Spirit and understand what he is saying to the churches. To everyone who is victorious, I will give fruit from the tree of life in the paradise of God. End of letter. All right. Uh, let, let's talk about a little bit of background here. There's some, uh, this, this is pretty fascinating. Ephesus was a really important uh, city in that day and age. It was a huge city uh, by, uh, by their standards. It was probably between 400 and 500,000 people uh, lived in that city. It was a big ancient city. It was in modern day Turkey. Um, today it's just a little tiny village, but I mean, this city was a big deal. Uh, we also know, like, from, biblical, uh, from a biblical perspective, Ephesus was a really big deal. Um, all the other letters, we don't know much about those cities, but Ephesians comes up a lot in the Bible, right? Uh, we have the letter that Paul wrote to, uh, to the Ephesus, the letter of Ephesians. We see uh, Ephesians talked about, or Ephesus talked about in the book of Acts. Um, this, was, this, was, this was a big deal. Um, and uh, they received a lot of ministry. They were the recipient of a lot of missionaries. So the Apostle Paul was starting a church there. Um, we just read that other apostles, apostles uh, means a sent one, so other basically missionaries were going to Ephesus and trying to spread uh, their, uh, what, this, what Jesus just said was their lies. Um, and so this is this a really important strategic location, okay? Um, let, all right, let's keep going. So here's what we're going to look at today. We're going to look at really three things, what the Ephesians got right, what they got wrong, and, and Jesus told them they had a choice, okay? They have a choice on what to do next, and that choice, I think, still stands for us today. We have a choice to make today. So let's jump into the first one. Let's look at what they got right. Uh, I think we could say it like this. The Ephesians had great spiritual strengths. Uh, to their credit, they had a lot going for them in a really positive way. Let's look at just a few of them. Uh, now, remember, Jesus said that he's the one who walks amongst the lampstands. He's the one who walks amongst the churches. Um, Jesus said, wherever two or three are gathered, I am there with them. Jesus is here with us right now. He knows every, he, he sees everything. He knows what we're doing, and he's seen what this church has done, and he commends them for their hard work. These guys get at it. They're not, it's not a lazy church. They're working really, really hard. Uh, they're good deeds. Some of your translations say hard works. Some of your translations say good deeds. Um, now, wh what does it mean to do good deeds? Uh, good deeds is when you're doing something for Christ. So if you wake up early to spend time uh, in, in prayer and scripture, that's a good deed. If you forgive an enemy, like, but not because you just want the guilt to be gone or the pressure to be gone, but because you, you forgive somebody because Jesus has forgiven you, that's a good deed. Uh, when you serve, that's a good deed. Huge shout out to everybody in Madison. 
Um, I, I don't know if everybody in Huntsville or watching online knows this, but uh, the folks in Madison, they show up super early every Sunday morning. They set up the building. They have a worship service, and then they got to tear it down because it's an elementary school, all right? Like, those guys are doing a lot of good deeds. Well done, Madison. Yeah, the, uh, applause breaks out in Huntsville for, for those of you in Madison. Uh, when we give, when we serve, th these are good deeds. These are hard works. These are the sort of things that uh, Jesus is commending that church for doing. Uh, he goes on, patient endurance. Uh, they didn't quit. Uh, one of the things that we know about church history, that we, I said this was like during the apostolic, uh, uh, ap help me out, somebody. Apostolic. apostolic. I got it right the first time, failed the second time. I will not say that Sunday morning uh, here in Huntsville. Okay, during that season, like, man, there was a lot of persecution. And, and then even though, like, like people were, um, even though they knew the truth, a lot of them were abandoning their faith. Um, in fact, I mean, again, this is very relevant for us today, I believe. Um, I know at least in my life, there, there's never been a season, like maybe the last five years, where, where we see what we're calling deconstruction, where people are walking away from their faith. What does that mean? It means that there's some sort of, like, like, like the scripture says this, God says this, culture says this, there's a tension, what am I going to do? And I think a lot of us have probably seen people, we know people, maybe you are one of the people where we said, hey, this pressure is too great, I'm just going to walk away from this, I'm going to go this direction, I'm going to go I'm gonna go with culture on this. But, but the Ephesians didn't. It said that they patiently endured. They, they didn't quit. They didn't, they didn't give up on the truth. Um, it's incredible. And Jesus commends them for that. Uh, not every church will be commended for that. But the Ephesians were. Uh, the next thing Jesus commended them for was they did not tolerate evil people. This doesn't mean they didn't love evil people. It doesn't mean they didn't love everybody. But they didn't tolerate them. They, 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 they said they, they were able to say, like, no, like, that's not true. What you're saying is wrong. That's against God's word. And Jesus commends them for that. Uh, uh, Jesus goes a little bit further. He says, not only do you not tolerate evil people, but you examine the claims of those who came with the new messages, and you determine that that did not line up with truth, and you discover that they are liars. And Jesus is agreeing with the Ephesians. Yeah, you're right. They are liars. Um, you could say it like this. The Ephesians were really good with their Bibles. Like, they knew the truth, and they stood up for the truth. They were bold for the truth. Um, you know, I, they, were, they were loving, at least at first. <laughs> and they were able to say, like, no, that's not true. Or they were able to be truth and, you know, truth and grace. And Jesus commended them for those things. And then towards the end of the later, it says they hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans. Uh, let me go into this for a second. Nicolaitans, this is, um, this is, this is an interesting one. Um, it, there's really two schools of thought of who are these Nicolaitans. The Bible doesn't tell us who the Nicolaitans are, but church history tells us a good bit about them. Uh, two schools of thought. The first school of thought is that um, it's, it's from a guy named Nicholas. If you go back to Acts chapter 6, you may remember the story if you're familiar with the Bible. There were the first deacons. Remember this? The apostles, they were getting very, very busy. The church was growing. So they created like an office of deacons. And deacons started uh, waiting and, and serving people. One of those first seven deacons was a man named Nicholas. And, and, one, and we see that in Acts chapter 6. Well, church history tells us that Nicholas eventually kind of parted from the faith. Uh, Nicholas decided that um, God's grace was enough. And so you can just do whatever you want to do. Anything God told you to do, anything the Bible says, don't worry about that stuff. God's grace is enough. Everything's going to pan out in the end. In fact, he actually, it actually got, it got pretty bad. Um, uh, uh, one of the things that um, Nicholas is on the record, or uh, at least being said about him, was that he eventually got to a place where he basically, what we would call in today's terms, had an open marriage, and he would share his wife with other people. Um, and, and, but here's the, that may, all right, I don't know if that sounds crazy to you or not. Um, but a lot of people went with him. And so the Nicolaitans is actually going to have several. Uh, we're going to hear about Nicolaitans and some of the other letters as well. And Jesus is saying, listen, I, I hate the works of the Nicolaitans, and, and you do too, and I commend you for that. Uh, the other school of thought, the other school of thought is that it has nothing to do with Nicholas. And, and that it actually, there's two words here. Um, this Nicolaitans is basically two words. The first one being people. It's actually where we get the word Nike from, the first half of that. Nicholas, it's not a person, but rather that word we get Nike from, which means the conquer. And the other one means people, so to conquer people. And in the context, it really means um, uh, the conquering the lay people. Um, some people think that Nicolaitan was that during the apostolic age, 
Come on, let him, come on, I got it right, everybody. The, the apostolic age. And um, that that during during that time when when you know when all when when the apostles were, were passing away, where they were dying, and then John was the last one who died, that there was a whole new class of clergy, and the clergy began to lord their authority over the people in the church. That that there there were there were like the clergy, and then there was everybody else in the church. And, and apparently from some church historic sites, like, man, it got messy. And it got nasty. And we know Jesus hates that. In Matthew chapter 26, Jesus said, hey, if you want to be great in my kingdom, you must become a servant. If you want to be number one, you got to become a slave. He said that, that the, 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 the people who do not believe in God lord their authority over others, and you're not to do that. So whichever these, whoever the Nicolaitans are, is it, is it people who basically gave a license to sin? Departed from the faith, departed from truth, or was it clergy taking advantage of people in the church? I don't know, but I can tell you this. We can point to different scriptures, and Jesus hates both of those things. Both of those things are true. We need to stay away from both of those things. All right. All right, so they did a lot of good things. The church in Ephesus did a lot of good things. Hardworking, good deeds, didn't give up. They stood up for the truth. They were probably good with the scriptures. They were testing out, hey, is this is true, this is not true. And they hated the deeds of the Nicolaitans. Again, they didn't hate, they didn't hate people. They didn't say they hate people, they hated their deeds. All that said, let's move to point number two. Despite the Ephesian strengths, they were at risk of losing it all because they missed the main point. They were at risk of losing it all because they, they missed the main point. Um, they were doing a phenomenal job with a lot of right things, but they forgot why they were doing it. They got really good at hard works, but they forgot why they were doing hard works. They got really good at standing for the truth, but they forgot why they were standing for the truth. And Jesus says, uh, go back to the scripture, what does it say? I have this complaint against you. You don't love me or each other as you did at first. I mean, you don't have to answer this out loud, but have any of you experienced that before? Where it's like, man, you got really good at doing things for God, but you forgot why you were doing them in the first place. You got really disciplined with your spiritual discipline, or you joined all the small groups, and you're at small groups like every night of the week, but then your heart actually began growing cold towards other people, or you started reading the Bible, and you got really, really good at studying the Bible and understanding the Bible yet you become extremely judgmental. Now, this is what's really interesting to me about the Ephesians. So the, the, this letter that we're reading from Jesus, this was recorded and written down around A.D. 95, okay, around A.D. 90 to 95. Um, but, but as I mentioned, we, we know a lot about the, other, the Ephesians. And so the first letter that we know about the Ephesians comes from the Apostle Paul, uh, the, the book of Ephesians. It was written in 60, all right, 60 A.D., so the book of Ephesians written in 60 A.D., 35 years later, give or take, the, the book of Revelation was written. How things have changed. Look what Paul said in his opening remarks to the church in Ephesians. Ephesians 1 verse 15. He said, ever since I first heard of your strong faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for God's people everywhere. And then he goes on to, to finish his letter out, Right? At, by by 60, 60 AD, the church in Ephesus had a reputation for loving the Lord and loving people everywhere. So much so that even though Paul had not been to Ephesus at that point, he had heard about their reputation for loving other people. Fast forward 35 years to the book of Revelation. Jesus is saying, why have you abandoned that first love? A lot changed in 35 years. So what happened? Well, obviously, we're not exactly sure. Um, if, I could, if I could speculate, um, I, I know there's been seasons in my life where I've gone through some of this. There have been seasons in your life where you've probably have gone through this. Um, I, I think that clue that they, were, that they persevered and they never gave up, they never quit, I think that's a clue. Have you ever, have you ever man, like, like you've ever been challenged for your faith? Have you ever faced even like the slightest level of persecution or the slightest level of judgment because of your faith? Imagine that going on for year after year after year after year. Here's what I think probably happened to the Ephesians. They got really, 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 really good at defending their faith. 
and they become calloused because of it. They got really, really, really good at defending their faith against false teachers, and they got really, really good at studying their Bible and living out perfect theology and perfect doctrine and all these sort of things, but, 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 they, but they, 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 some, a, a trap snuck in on them. They got so good at the truth that they let the most important thing fall by the wayside. That they got so good at having a high standard theologically that they actually became judgmental. They had a high standard of like, hey, this is what God says, and we will die for that. We will live for that. But they forgot to love Jesus, and they forgot to love their neighbors themselves. Now, my guys, my friends, I don't see why that couldn't happen here. You know, we started this church for anyone who feels like church isn't for them, and we, we, we started off right. We started off with, hey, we love Jesus. We've been impacted by Jesus. We want other people to find a love that we've found. And then, like, and then, like, sometimes, like, our theology starts getting challenged. And we start digging into the scripture, and we start saying, like, like listen, like, this is our defense. Like, this is why we believe what we believe. Like, this stuff is important. These are our convictions, and if, if we're not careful, we'll get so caught up in defending the faith that our hearts actually grow cold towards others and even one another. Like we'll always be in battle mode, <laughs> always prepared to defend the faith, always prepared to do these sort of things. And if you're not careful, those are good things. We always need to be prepared to defend the faith. But if we're not careful, we'll start having hardened hearts. We'll start growing cynical. And that is absolutely a very relevant warning to essential church. Actually, it's a warning to all of us, all Christians today. I think as we, we're living in a place where um, maybe Christian norms are becoming less and less normal in American society, I, I think many of us, we're going to have to you know, say, like, hey, this, these are my convictions. This is what I believe. This is what God's told us. And that may not make you very popular at work or school or wherever, but it's true. Thank you. But here's the thing. While we're standing for the truth, just like the Ephesians did, we must stand for the truth. And we must also continue having a tender hearts from those who attack us, from our enemies, from our enemies, and for people who are disconnected from God. Because if you're not careful, we'll just go into defense mode and our hearts will grow cold. Let's keep going. Specifically, he said, don't love Jesus. You don't love Jesus, not like the way you did it first. I, I want to say something about that. I, I asked a few people uh, this week, what, how, how do you love Jesus, right? Like, how do, you, how do you love Jesus? And, you know, I was usually confronted with, like, blank stares. And so I just want to tell you, I, I believe the way that you love Jesus is the way that you love anybody. Uh, go ahead and show a picture of my wife. Uh, I think I think we got a picture of my wife up there. Yes, the wife. There's the family. That was last week, Easter. Um, the way that I, the way like I love Jesus. How do I love Jesus? The way I love my wife. I spend time with her. I listen to her. I care about her. I serve her. Uh, in fact, actually, the Bible says that as her husband, I'm to lay down my life for her, just like Christ laid down His life for the church. So, so how do like how do I love Jesus? I love Jesus the way I love you. The way that I, I love my wife. We serve, we spend time, we, we listen, we talk to them, we talk with them, we talk about them in positive ways to others. Jesus also told us in John 14, verse 15, he says, if you love me, obey my commandments. And I love what Pastor TJ said this week. TJ said, hey, um, if you love somebody, you care about their opinion 10 times more than anybody else. Is that true for you? If you love somebody, do you care way more about their opinion? How much more should we care about Jesus' opinion than somebody else's opinion? How much more should we care about Jesus' opinion and, and what he told us here in the scripture than what, than what society or what culture tells us? If, if you love Jesus, you, you'll care about his opinion more. All right, let's wrap up point number two. I, I, think, I, think, I think the gist of it is this. The church in Ephesus was very, very mature but they forgot why they did what they did. They started off on the right track. They had lots of great disciplines. They knew their Bibles. But they fell out of love with Jesus, and they fell out of love with one another, which leads to the third and final point. Jesus loves you and the people around us too much to let us go on not loving. Jesus speaks some, he does not mince words at the end of this letter. 
He says, repent. What does he say? Turn back to me. I'm sorry, let me start. Verse 5. Look how far you have fallen. Turn back to me and do the works you did at first. If you don't repent, I will come and remove your lampstand from its place among the churches. Jesus is saying that this church in Ephesus, and he's saying it to our church today, and he's saying it to you specifically, repent and be rewarded. Or I will take away that lampstand. Now, in the context here, what does it mean? I, I believe it means this, that if our church, if we start falling into the traps that that church in Ephesus did, if you start falling into that traps, the church is, the church is not this building. The church is just us people, Right? If we start falling into that trap, what Ephesus did, they, 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 they were mature in a lot of ways, but they were super immature in other ways. If we don't do that, God loves us too much to let us keep on going in this mess. God will remove a central church. Like, like if we keep doing the good deeds and we keep persevering, but we lose our first love, we lose our love of Jesus, we lose our love for one another, God loves you too much, God loves me too much, God loves our church too much to let us stay in that. He will remove this church and hopefully by his grace move us into healthier places. But I would really rather us not be wiped out like that. So, so we, we have a choice, like, like repent or the lampstand will be removed. The Greek word for repent, metaneo, means to change your mind or purpose. So what I want to call everybody to do today, in just a second we're going to have a time of response. I mean, I'd, I'd love for our response to today to really, like, really lean into metaneo, to repentance, to change like our, our, our thinking, to change our, our, our purpose, to change our will. Maybe, maybe, we, maybe you've done an incredible job at, at getting into, getting involved in church. Maybe you've been doing a great job at reading your Bible. Uh, maybe you're here and you've, you've, you, you invited someone to Easter for the first time last week, and that was a leap of faith for you. Maybe some of you, you're starting to be generous financially. But I, I want you to do business with God during this time of response and just ask the question, am I doing the right things, but has my heart grown cold? to Jesus or to others. I saw another commentary. He said this. <laughs> he said, this is, this is good advice for you every single day. Uh, go ahead and show this final slide. Every day we should wake up and we say, remember your first love. Two, repent. Three, do the things you did at first. Four, repeat. I think, I think this is good. So during this last song, during our time of response, Remember your love for Christ at first, those of you who are Christ followers. Remember how, just how sweet that faith was, that, that relationship with Jesus when you first began to follow Jesus. Remember the purity of your love towards him. Remember the purity of your love towards others. I mean, go back to that. Go back to that. If you felt any conviction today and you're like, man, you know what, I think... I think my heart towards Jesus and others has grown cold. And repent of it. Turn back to your first love today. For anybody who doesn't have um, a relationship with Jesus, maybe you never, you never claimed to have had a relationship with Jesus, man, I want to invite you to place your faith in Jesus today. Um, one of the things that Jesus says throughout this letter is that I'm coming soon. And one day you will see Jesus. Man, get right with him. Repent. The word repent is used more in the book of Revelation than any other book of the Bible. Turn back to him. Stop pursuing your own ways and start pursuing the ways of Christ. There are ways of life. If you've been following Christ for long, you, you can agree with me what John 10, 10 says. Uh, Jesus in that verse says um, that the thief, speaking of our enemy, Satan, comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. But I have come that you may have the abundant life. Place your faith in Jesus Christ. Find what you've always been looking for. Find that abundant life. Let's pray. God, we love you. We need you. Jesus, please, please do not let me or our church fall into that pit Ephesus fell into. I want us to see more and more good works, more and more good deeds. I want to see us giving away more $3,750 checks 
to those experiencing homelessness. I want to see more people getting baptized. I want to see more people getting into their Bibles. But God, all that's nothing if we lose our first love. Holy Spirit, would you come upon this place? Would you convict us? Lord, if anybody here, maybe they're just, maybe their heart's dull. Maybe they, maybe they, maybe they have fallen out of love with you or with others, God, would you, Holy Spirit, would you move in their lives right now and help them to remember their first love? And for anybody here who maybe you haven't had a relationship with Jesus, but you would like to begin one right now, here's what I'm going to pray. I'm actually going to pray a prayer out loud. And if you would like to begin following Jesus tonight, um, I'm going to ask you to just, man, maybe just, just whisper the prayer out loud as well, and I'll lead, you repeat it after me. Here's how that prayer would go. God, I am sorry. I am sorry for my sins. I am sorry I have been selfish. I am sorry I am only now coming to you. I receive your free gift, and that is eternal life through your son, Jesus Christ. I acknowledge that Jesus came and he died on a cross for my sins. I acknowledge that Jesus was raised on the third day. He's alive now and he's coming back soon. Jesus, I repent of my old ways and I turn towards you. Thank you for saving me. If you're here and you don't have a relationship with Jesus, in your own words, there's nothing magical about the words I just said. In your own words, Pray that prayer to God right now. God, we need you, and we love you. And we ask for all these things in the name of Jesus. Amen.